I must uh, welcome everybody. It's, it's great to see so many people coming uh, and staying so late today. And uh, I'd like to turn your attention to something a little more clean than blood and platelets and vessel walls and cuts in arteries and think a little bit more clean in terms of electrograms. This is refined cardiology for the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> hmm. All right, sorry about that. So the title of my talk today is Latest on Management of Atrial Fibrillation from Drugs to Devices. It's just really a Cook's tour, which we're going to talk about, uh, really about the rhythm control of atrial fibrillation. Of course, it's a massive topic, uh, and it's not going to touch on, on issues such as anticoagulation, which is going to be dealt with uh, in our last session of the day, the Mind the Gap session, which is obviously a very exciting area. This talk is not going to be dealing with that. That's coming at the end of the day. Uh, I must just at this point explain to everybody who doesn't know otherwise what an enormous thrill this is for me to have Dr. Banerjee and Dr. Balakis actually sit in the same room after I've mentioned the word atrial fibrillation for more than 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, I find it interesting that they've called it a hot topic because normally when I mention the word atrial fibrillation in front of them, it becomes a very cold topic very, very quickly. <laughs> but moving quite a, moving along, uh, just a few, few disclosures there. So atrial fibrillation has been known about for a long time. In fact, Harvey, the very first person to describe the, the uh, circulation system, described it, but it was really... This guy over here, uh, Jean-Baptiste de Sanac, who was actually personal physician to Louis XV, who actually described atrial fibrillation. Um, I've also put up here Vulpian. There are many other pioneers uh, who led to its characterization, but it was essentially finally characterized as an illness or a condition in 1910 by Sir Thomas Lewis in England, who was a colleague of Eindhoven's who invented the electrocardiogram. Now, when it comes to atrial fibrillation, it is a complex issue indeed. And whenever we are faced with a patient with atrial fibrillation, we have two things to categorize. Number one, where are they in this spectrum? And number two, is the atrial fibrillation symptomatic or not symptomatic? So in terms of the spectrum, the initial episode, really, that's just on itself. Because there are some people who will have one episode of atrial fibrillation. They may have it after they've had um, a weekend of heavy drinking, after a weekend uh, of pneumonia, uh, after coronary artery bypass surgery, uh, or some other procedure. They may have atrial fibrillation. It may be an isolated episode. We're not concerned with that today. It's these two middle groups that we're concerned with today. That is our patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which, as you guys all know, is self-terminating episodes, strictly defined as episodes which last less than seven days, but usually last less than 48 hours, and persistent atrial fibrillation. That's atrial fibrillation which persists until cardioversion using electricity or drugs is used. Permanent atrial fibrillation is where basically we, we and the patient have thrown in the towel. It's not a strict definition. It's defined by the patient and the doctor to say, you know what, we've reached the end of the line here. We're not going to try and get you out of atrial fibrillation anymore. And we're not really concerned with that today. What I'm going to be talking about is how to get people back into sinus rhythm. And so for that reason, we're going to be talking about paroxysmal and persistent patients. And for the time being, really, it's symptomatic patients because clinical acumen and indeed the guidelines recommend that these ablation procedures and these drugs that I'm going to discuss today are only used for symptomatic patients. If your patient is truly asymptomatic, we generally adopt a rate control and anticoagulation strategy. But I will uh, caution you, my friends, to, to say that a patient is truly asymptomatic until they've had a shot at sinus rhythm because some people think they're asymptomatic. And you get them back into sinus for a week or two and they feel uh, a whole lot better. It was God's intended rhythm and everybody deserves uh, cardioversion, which is a drug which has a half-life of 0 0.1 second. So when it comes to atrial fibrillation, you've got your patient classified, you know, are they persistent patients, are they, par are they paroxysmal, do we know that yet? Uh, and second of all, is this patient symptomatic or asymptomatic? The next thing you have to consider for each and every patient is, am I going to adopt a rhythm control strategy in which I'm going to try a number of different things. I'm going to maybe try to start with antiarrhythmic drugs. I may move on to an ablation. There's going to be cardioversions involved. A pacemaker may be required to support bradycardia, uh, which may be part of the disease process, plus minus the effects of the antiarrhythmic drug. Or am I going to send this patient for an AF ablation? If so, what kind of AF ablation, standard or hybrid? Um, 
maybe they're going to be going for concomitant uh, AF surgery as well. Whereas this group over here, rate control, we have decided either because we've just tried for long enough or the patient is truly asymptomatic and doesn't mind being in AF. But we're not talking about that today. Again, what we're talking about today is this group, rhythm control, how are we trying to get these people back in sinus rhythm and keep them uh, in sinus rhythm. And so I'm going to start and finish with one drug only. So let's talk about dronadarone. What is dronadarone? Dronadarone, apart from being the biggest flop of any uh, drug in the past three years and really a useless antiarrhythmic drug, which I'm about to demonstrate to you, there were high hopes for uh, dronadarone. This over here is our friend amiodarone, which we know is a highly efficacious antiarrhythmic drug, but full of side effects. And it's mostly due to these two iodine moieties over there that we get the side effects from amiodarone. So for 20 years in development, uh, people were trying to develop what we called amiolite, which was amiodarone without the iodine moieties. And uh, the addition over here of this methane, methane sulfhydryl group over here leads to dronatum. And there were high hopes that we were going to achieve the antiarrhythmic effect of amiodarone without the negative side effects. So the first study that came along were two studies. Now, don't ask me why they named all the studies after Greek gods. It's possibly got something to do with Dr. Balakis. I don't know. Uh, but they did name all the studies after Greek gods and Greek legends. Uh, turned into a Greek tragedy, but that's another story. Uh, and the first studies were that uh, dronadarone compared to placebo left patients in sinus rhythm for longer. Well, I should hope so. I mean, it's an antiarrhythmic drug. It's not big news. It was touted as big news, but it's not that big news. It wasn't compared to Sotlol. It wasn't compared to Tickerson. It was compared to placebo, but nevertheless, reassuring news. And then this study came along, which was a little bit of a curveball, because normally when we think about atrial fibrillation, we're looking for decrease in episodes or decrease in symptoms. This actually went as far as to look at reduced cardiovascular hospitalizations and death uh, as, a, as an endpoint. By the way, guys, it's 236. <laughs> And sure enough, this drug showed a reduction in the primary endpoint, which was reduced cardiovascular hospitalizations and death, and everybody was going around saying, this stuff is like magic dust, right? You give it to someone with atrial fibrillation, and they're going to live longer. Well, not really, because it was a combined endpoint of reduced cardiovascular hospitalizations and death, and all of the reduction in endpoint was a reduction in cardiovascular hospitalizations, which were all hospitalizations for AFib. So if you really looked at this study, it was congratulations, this, people's keep, this drug keeps people in sinus rhythm for a little while, keeps them out of hospital. Still reassuring. Or reassuring until we come to Andromeda, which showed that when you give this drug to patients with heart failure, they die quicker and the drug, the trial was stopped prematurely. Bad news. A dangerous warning sign. You give this to people with heart failure, they're going to die sooner. That's not good. What, do, what is heart failure? Is it diastolic and systolic? And what ejection fraction cutoff are we talking about? And what New York Heart Association are we, are we cutting off at? And for a while, people were winging it a little bit with this drug and saying, I'm giving it to everybody who's got even mild or no heart failure, but anyone who's got even moderate heart failure, no drug. But really, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm putting my neck out a little bit here, but that's OK. I go to the VA every day. <clears throat> uh, but I would say that really the nail in the coffin, certainly as far as I'm concerned, for this drug being a widely applicable, successful drug, was the PALACE trial, which showed that if you gave it to people with persistent atrial fibrillation, okay, so for some reason they decided it was a good idea to give this drug for persistent atrial fibrillation because it's said to have some rate control effect, that was causing an increased mortality. Now we have two huge groups of patients those with persistent AF and those with heart failure, where this drug is showing an increased mortality, plus it doesn't seem to be a very strong drug. Therefore, this drug has kind of gone out as a potential mainstream promise uh, in atrial fibrillation. However, I will say that if tolerated, and if the patient is not in persistent AFib and they don't have any heart failure, and it does work, it's great because it doesn't cause the side effects of amiodarone, and it doesn't cause torsade de pointe, but those patients are rare. So, we are left with procedures. Now, when I started with uh, electrophysiology back in 1996, it was my first research job. Catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation was an absolute dream. The only person who had any experience with atrial fibrillation 
cure was a, a surgeon called Cox who invented this Cox procedure, which Dr. Jessen uh, now actually is an expert at doing uh, in the operation as a concomitant procedure. We'll come to that in a second. And he was, this was a cut and sew technique where they basically cut up the atrium into little pieces and sewed it back up again. But there was design in it in that there was a box around the pulmonary veins that was coincidental. And there were these other lesions designed to baffle the electrical impulse all the way from the sinus node down to the AV node without having all those nasty wavelets of AF inter interfering with everything. And Cox had a success rate of 94%, but nobody else could really reproduce his um, results. As far as trying to do this with a catheter inside the heart, really that was just a dream. There were one or two people who were doing it. The procedures were lasting two days, okay? And this, the operative mortality was extremely high with high risk of stroke, and everybody was still in atrial fibrillation. And really it was a dream until this study came along, which was a groundbreaking study, and really changed the way that we think about ablation of atrial fibrillation. That's from the Bordeaux group of Michel Hasseguer, a very innovative group who come out of Bordeaux, who re reported to everyone's amazement uh, that, in fact, in patients with paroxysmal, that you could ablate this by ablating triggers in the pulmonary veins. It really came out of nowhere, took everybody by surprise, but people quickly started to reproduce his results. Very quickly, we realized that, it, it's, that you, when you do this procedure, you don't just ablate one pulmonary vein, because triggers may be coming from there, and two hours later, a trigger may be coming from there. Very quickly, we learned that we should ablate all four pulmonary veins. Very quickly, we learned that it's really only, uh, as a standalone procedure, really only works for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And very quickly, we learned that we should keep our ablation catheter away from the inside of the vein and ablate more towards the antrum, the mouth of the vein, to avoid pulmonary vein stenosis. So, when we first started out this procedure, we were ablating these pulmonary veins. Sorry. Here are the pulmonary veins coming into the left atrium. This is a view of the atrium from behind. Purely with x-ray, there's the ablation catheter, and we threw in, and we still throw in, a lasso catheter which goes around. It's a circumferential catheter and gives us circumferential signals from inside the pulmonary vein. But now we've started using mapping systems, and I'm going to go very quickly through them, very, very quickly, just in the interest of time. So the title of my talk is Devices and Drugs. We've done with the, with the drugs. Let's talk about the devices. And the first that I'm going to talk about are the two main mapping systems that are around today. This is the CARTO system. Carto system currently uses uh, a combination of magnetic and impedance-based signals to work out where catheters are inside the heart. This is a magnet which is placed under the patient, and these patches around the patient are, have magnets in them, but also have impedance sensors. We then create a three-dimensional map of the heart, a rendition of the chamber, and we introduce an ablation or mapping catheter into that field, and each of these poles puts out a specific frequency which is picked up by the patches and the catheter is located in space and in time with an accuracy of less than half a centimeter. We draw this virtual map of the chamber that we're dealing with, uh, in this case the left atrium, and we're able to maneuver around with accuracy, knowing exactly where we've been, knowing exactly how to come back to that place without tapping the x-ray too much, and we're bringing down our fluoroscopy significantly. The St. Jude system is known as ESI. That uses purely impedance-based technology. Obviously, there's a lot of argument backwards and forwards, which is better, which is more accurate. This has some advantages. The other one has other advantages and disadvantages, etc. It's beyond um, the scope of this talk to go into all of that. But essentially, the St. Jude ESI system is very similar, except only uses an impedance-based technology. But the end result is the same. You get your lasso catheter uh, shown up. You get the inside of the vein rendered for you, and without putting your foot in the x-ray, you can move your ablation catheter around, look at the signals, and look at this map, and you're doing a non-fluoroscopic ablation. Just before I move on from mapping systems, I just want to say that there's a new mapping system coming out from Boston Scientific known as the Rhythmia system, which promises to be even better than the systems that we have at the moment. Moving on to ablation systems, I'm going to discuss very briefly two ablation systems that we use. One is externally irrigated catheter ablation, that was a great advance because very quickly we learned that by cooling the tip of the catheter, we cause our lesions to go deeper in the heart. Okay? It's not all about getting surface temperatures very high. By cooling the tip of the catheter, we, we apply our power more deeply to the heart and it creates pure transmural lesions. 
Also, by having this irrigation coming out of the end of the catheter, we feel that we're washing little bits of char and small microthrombi away and re drastically reducing the risk of stroke that are caused from these procedures, such that our risk of stroke from this procedure now is well below 1%. I will quickly move on to this other piece of groundbreaking uh, technology that has been used specifically for the electrical isolation of pulmonary veins, and that is the cryo balloon, which is, was acquired by Medtronic. Only mention these, who makes these things so that you guys can look it up uh, a few years ago. And essentially, that looks to isolate the veins with balloon, balloon technology. A balloon is introduced into the orifice of the pulmonary vein. Now they have a, a mapping catheter which goes distally to it. Probably doesn't work that well, but I want you to focus on the balloon. And what happens is a refrigerant is injected into the space because there's actually two balloons there. And a refrigerant is injected into the space between the two balloons, bringing this right down to minus 70 degrees centigrade and causing freeze damage in a pretty safe way with slightly less durable results. I'm not going to go through the advantages and disadvantages of each because there are advantages and disadvantages of each, but those are the two main energy sources that we have today. That's the balloon inflated in the vein. Dye is shot through the end of the catheter to make sure that none of that dye extravasates back into the atrium and that you've got a tight fit with your balloon. Other balloon technologies we use, such as laser, microwave. Laser may still uh, have a showing in the future, but right now it's cryo balloon that is used. Um, I'm, in the final parts of my talk today, I just want to introduce you guys to this algorithm over here. We speak about paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and persistent atrial fibrillation. As we know, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is a trigger-driven disease. These are triggers which in about 90 to 95% of the time are coming from the pulmonary veins. There are extra pulmonary vein triggers as well, but 90 to 95% of the time, if you ablate those pulmonary veins in a safe and effective manner, you're going to take care of a good deal of your patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Probably 70 to 80% of them, with the caveat that 20% of them will need a second procedure. That's always a caveat when it comes to atrial fibrillation. My colleagues over here, they would say that there's a caveat whenever it comes to electrophysiology, but we won't go into that right now. So, for that, we can do a pulmonary vein ablation, okay? And we're going to take care of a lot of that atrial fibrillation, either using the radio frequency with the cool tip or the cryo balloon. But persistent atrial fibrillation is a much more complex animal, and we know that it becomes more of a substrate-driven disease. The trigger becomes less important. The substrate becomes more important with persistent and permanent atrial fibrillation. And unfortunately, just isolating the pulmonary veins is not enough anymore because we have other problems, okay? So we end up using hybrid approaches with ablation plus antiarrhythmic drugs. Often pacemakers are required along that path as well, and we've been used to that for many years. Why is persistent atrial fibrillation so much different? It's not just the triggers anymore. Now the whole of the atrium basically becomes an AF factory in a way, particularly the posterior wall of the left atrium. There are many different theories out there, and you know that when there's a lot of different theories, it means that we don't completely understand it all, and that's definitely true when it comes to persistent atrial fibrillation. What we do know is that we would like to burn a lot more on the posterior wall than we can with current ablation strategies, because with the catheters I've shown you, we cannot place linear lesions. Okay? The other thing is, is that the esophagus often runs behind here, and if we ablate too much on the posterior wall, we run the risk of creating the fatal complication of the atrioesophageal fistula. That brings us back to Dr. Jessen's world, the world of cardiac surgery. The Cox maze 1 was quickly advanced by Cox himself to through a 2 and then a 3, and that's what we're left with today. The Cox 3 procedure, this is the back of the atrium, involves isolating all the pulmonary veins and creating linear lesions. Okay, with atrial appendectomy okay, on both sides. Now, Dr. Jessen will often perform this with great success during concomitant surgery for a valve or for uh, a cabbage sometimes, someone who's got atrial fibrillation. They happen to be there. He's going to use the system that I'm going to show you. But this system uh, of ablation lesions is also applied for hybrid therapy where the patient gets both surgical, if you will, intervention with what I'm going to show you now, plus an ablation. So an attempt is made to recreate that Cox Mage maze therapy uh, by this company called Atriacure, which is a thoracoscopic, it's a thoracoscopic, thoracoscopic procedure, two holes in that side of the patient's chest, 
two holes on that side of the patient's chest. I'm moving very quickly through this. This is the main tool that they use. It's a bipolar clamp. They literally take this clamp and put the clamp on either side of the pulmonary vein and cut off the pulmonary vein's electrical supply that way. Very effective tool. There it is, clamping on the pulmonary vein. That's combined with other small catheters, which are generally cryoablation catheters, where spot lesions and additional lines can be drawn. And then a couple of days later, the patient's kept in hospital. A couple of days later, the patient comes back to the EP lab and has an ablation procedure endocardially where the electrophysiologist goes in and tidies up whatever the surgeon hasn't been able to clean up. So that basically reproduces your Cox Maze II procedure. There are no formal results on the results of this surgery, and there's not that many people yet in the States doing this, although some centers are. So what we've been doing at our center is another procedure, uh, which is also a hybrid ablation, where we use, uh, we use the, the, the great skills of Dr. Jessen, who goes in in the morning, who's been an absolute invaluable uh, partner, in, not in just in this, but in other aspects of our electrophysiology. And he goes in in the morning, and they do the sub approach. They get transdiaphragmatic access. He then lifts up the heart with this tool over here. Through this tool, this tool also acts as a portal for his instruments, which I'm going to show you. And he places this instrument across the back on the outside of the heart, which finally, for us, creates linear lesions. We can't do this on the inside of the heart, but Dr. Jessen can do this from the outside of the heart. This is also cooled, so it's a very nice catheter because it's linear and it squirts out fluid from, from the, its entire length, which cools it and it sucks down onto the heart as well and gives these very powerful lesions. And he snakes that catheter around and achieves about an 80% isolation of the pulmonary veins. But what has been recently introduced is this additional lesion set. By the way, this is a company called uh, N-Contact, and this is known as the Convergent Procedure. We've done about 25 to 27, uh, 27 now, I think, at the VA. Is this additional lesion set where we can place these linear lesions across that posterior wall of that left atrium, which is so arrhythmogenic and persistent atrial fibrillation, as we discussed. This is done all on the same day in the EP lab. Once Dr. Jessen's finished, he leaves a drain in for us. We go in with our electroanatomical mapping system and touch up what he has uh, not been, been able to get. Our results are pretty encouraging. There is a learning curve with this procedure. That plus the change in the lesion set has meant that we're getting at least 60 to 70 percent of our persistent atrial fibrillation patients back into sinus rhythm for at least a year, which is very good for these patients. Again, we only choose the, the highest, uh, the most symptomatic of patients at this time. So very briefly, just before I conclude, just to, just to conclude and to remind you guys what we've spoken about, we've spoken about non-fluoroscopic mapping systems, lasso mapping catheters, cooled ablation catheters, cryo balloon, atria cure surgical system, and, uh, and these are all FDA approved for AF ablation. The end contact um, system, which we use, is not yet approved, and I must stress that, that is not yet approved, okay? Other things I've discussed today that are not yet approved, that I have discussed, nevertheless, nevertheless are the atria cure surgical system, some of the lasso mapping catheters, and the topira system, which is on this final slide of mine. Now, if you would have asked me, this is truly my last slide, um, if you would have asked me six months ago what I was most excited about in atrial fibrillation, I would have said this to you. The Topira system, which is aiming to make sense of multipolar electrograms read during atrial fibrillation. This is invented mostly out of the San Diego VA from some work that's been around for a long time. This is the theory that a lot of persistent atrial fibrillation is actually caused by rotors, and that these rotors always appear in the same part of the left atrium, particularly at anchor points, for example, where the left atrial appendage anchors with the left atrium, or where the pulmonary veins anchor with the left atrium. And what, what this company, whose name is Topira, have claimed is, is that they can analyze multipolar catheters and identify these rotors, and ablate these rotors and terminate atrial fibrillation. So it's a potential for the future. Uh, it's something that about six, seven months ago was looking really good, but we're just now starting to get the late data that, you know, that, okay, these patients are in sinus rhythm for a week. These patients are getting sinus rhythm in the EP lab. You know, this is a guy who's been in AFib for a long time. You go along with the system. He's been in AFib. He's failed cardioversions. 
It's been in AFib for two years. You go through the system, you put in five or six burns where these rotors are, never mind the pulmonary veins, and the guy's AF stops. I mean, anyone would be happy when they saw that. Uh, in, in summary, AF is a major management problem. New antiarrhythmic drugs have not performed as well as we hoped that they would. Ablation for AF became a possibility in the late 1990s. And for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, doing an effective pulmonary vein isolation procedure is going to get success with low complication rates in a fair number of patients, whether you do radiofrequency or cryo-balloon techniques. Uh, persistent atrial fibrillation requires significant uh, additional atrial work, which we're at the moment trying to tackle more with hybrid approaches using uh, this end contact system that I've told you. But uh, as we speak, the world of atrial fibrillation, you know, is in rapid flux, not just with these areas, but as we're going to hear with the world of anticoagulation in our final, final session today, uh, as well as the world of monitoring. So thank you very much for your attention.